Hey folks, this is Cal Lycus. In this video, we're going to be looking at synthesizing our very own kick drums using audio tools, synths and effects. Okay, so as we can see, I have on the desktop here, a Centroid Heisenberg and of course the output mixer. Uh, the Centroid I've just shortened, I've removed some of the tracks for it, just so things are a little bit cleaner on the desktop. And then the Heisenberg is just the default setting. I haven't done anything to it. Now, the first thing we're going to have a quick chat about is envelopes. So envelopes are actually really important for a wide variety of different synthesis. And it's really particularly important for a kick drum because we're actually going to use at least one, probably two different envelopes to make this work. And you need one of these envelopes, absolutely require a pitch envelope uh, in order to get this to work. So what is an envelope? Well, an amplitude envelope, which is what these first three here are, um, but don't have the, they don't have to be amplitude envelopes, but Typically, that's what they are. The main one is an amplitude envelope by default. And then we have a pitch envelope. The way an amplitude envelope works is we have attack, decay, sustain, release on this one. There are other variations, but on, I think, every synth there is in Audio Tool uh, where we have an envelope, it's always ADSR, attack, decay, sustain, release. Now, um, attack is the amount of time it takes to go from 0% to 100% amplitude. With that, it's done in milliseconds, and then we have this bend or curve, so we can choose how it slopes up there. Do we want it to be, uh, if I have that at 50%, it's more of a linear progression, and it will go up in a fairly straight way, in a fairly straight line, there, in a fairly straight line. However, that isn't really how our ears work, so it might be nice to have one of these curves going on so that we hear things in a more natural way. Now, Decay is going from 100% down to our sustain values, whatever our sustain value is. But we're going from decay to 100%, and it's the time taken to do that. So again, we're working in, in time measures here, so milliseconds. Our sustain level is a little bit different. Okay, so I will come back to that in a second, but it is a, it's the only one that's a little different. And then release is also a time parameter. And this is uh, the time it takes to go from our sustain value to zero after the note has finished playing. So once we release the note, so if we were playing on a keyboard, for example, uh, when you press on the note and you hold it down, that's sustain. And then when you release it, the release time is the time it takes to go from 100% uh, of the sustain value, not 100% amplitude, but 100% sustain value down to 0% and of, you know, absolutely no sound whatsoever. And again, that's done in time and therefore milliseconds. A sustain value, or in this case, sustain level, is the amplitude level that is produced when we sustain the note. So when we hold the note down, or the note is uh, you know, input as MIDI, the length of that note, for the duration of that note length, or the amount of time that we hold the note down, or whatever instrument you're playing, that is our sustain value. So this is the only one that's different. It's not a time parameter. This one is a measurement of amplitude. With that in mind, we have a pitch envelope, which of course isn't doing amplitude. It's now about the pitch. So we are going from, uh, at the moment, 12 semitones above our note, and then down to zero here. And I can choose to say, well, I want to go to minus 12. And that seems to be a on the face of it, that seems to be our only option. But other than that, attack, decay, and release are actually the same. It's still the time taken to get from A to B. It's to get from our uh, starting value down to our decay value and how long it takes us to get there. And then we have the amount of time it takes to get from our decay value to our sustain value. The big difference between a pitch envelope and any of these three envelopes here is that we have values that we can assign to our starting point and our decay point, a sustain point. It's no longer 0% and 100% and things like that. What we are going to do for this particular kick drum is use a pitch envelope. But why are we going to do that? So the reason we're going to use a pitch envelope on a kick drum is because what we're trying to essentially do is emulate the sound of an actual kick drum, one that we might hear out in the wild. So what do I mean by that? Well, when a kick drum is played uh, in, in real life, the beater, as it hits the skin of the drum, is 
flexing that skin from a slightly more slack position to a port position. And then as it releases, we have that moving back towards the, the slack position or its starting position, really. And it vibrates the whole time it's doing that. And that's how we get the sound. If you've ever got an elastic band, stretched it, and then you've uh, pinged it, the more uh, slack it is, the lower that note is. The more tight it is or more taut that, that band is, the, uh, the higher pitch that note is. And it's the same for these skins. So the more taut it is, the higher the pitch. The more slack it is, the lower the pitch. But we're going from a very taut position to a slightly, slightly more slack position very, very quickly. So we're going to emulate that with our pitch envelope. So the first thing I'm going to do is turn this pitch envelope on, make sure I have some notes in my MIDI note reel here. So I have a G1 is the note that I have selected. I just like working with G. Uh, I just find it more pleasing to my ear, I guess. You can choose any note you like, just make sure it's quite low because a kick drum is quite a low instrument. So we've turned that pitch envelope on. We're using a sine wave because we just want it to be a simple, simple sound. You can experiment, of course, with different uh, waveforms but just start off with a sine wave until you get a hang of how this works. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we were using the pitch envelope and we seem to be able to only go from 12 to minus 12. That is not the case. Over here, we can change the amount of semitones or the range. So at the moment it's plus or minus 12. I want to move it between a range of 48 uh, semitones or four octaves. So I'm actually going to put in 24 here, so we can go plus or minus 24, because this caps out at 36. So we, yeah, so caps out at 36, but we're going to put in 24. My sustain value, therefore, is going to come down to minus 24, as is my release value. My decay value, I'm just going to put at minus 12, and then we're going to start playing with these attack and decay times to get that punchy sound of the kick. So at the moment, this is how it sounds. which isn't really a kick. It's kind of an interesting sound, but it's not a kick drum. So let's shorten the attack time. Have it really quite short. We are going to bring that curve down so it's a bit more natural. We'll bring the curve down on the decay bend as well. And then we're going to bring the decay time. We could do somewhere around the 300 to 400 range. Again, this is to taste. So depending on the kick you want and the purpose you're going to use that for, so whether it's going to be in a trap track or uh, some drum and bass or perhaps techno or house each of those have different styles and different styles and then you personally will have a particular sound or style that you like uh, or enjoy making and all of that will contribute to the sound you're going to go for but let's have a listen to how this is now and there we have a kick uh, we could just leave it at that or we could start playing around with uh, other ele elements of the envelope, but let's bring the sustain up so it's a little louder. We could increase the release time on the, the main amplitude envelope here. So, as I mentioned, we have quite a short note length, really, for this kick drum. So we could have a, a slightly boomier kick that continues to resonate a little bit after the, the, uh, the note has been released by increasing that release time we could shorten that and have a really tight kick. If we want to, we could even bring the sustain all the way down and then start playing with the decay time here. So let's start here. We can hear that that's starting to get a bit clickier again. And we're starting to bring some of that transient out of it. Personally, I think that's where I personally prefer it, um, but again, it's all based on personal tastes and personal preferences. We could check check out uh, the tuning, so do we go up an octave? So we have plenty of options. Other things we can do is uh, bring in some distortion. I'm going to bring the drive down so I don't blow anyone's ears off when I hit play.
all of that kind of stuff works out quite well. But an interesting one that we can do, that people that always think about doing, is just EQ. So I've set the EQ to post here. So let's just hit play. So just using EQ and removing frequencies tends to be better than at, like accentuating them. So attenuating some of these frequencies using one of the bell curves here, which is what I'm doing by dropping this down. Um, that seems to shape the tone of this kick drum quite nicely, to be honest. And we can start playing around with stuff like that. Uh, we could also, and I would recommend doing this, put a low pass filter on, make it quite a steep um, order. Yeah, so sorry, a high pass filter, not a low pass filter. It's a low cut. We could put a um, high pass filter on, get rid of some of those lower frequencies. Definitely anything below 20 hertz. But depending on where you've got your sub, you might want to bring that up. Let's, let's yeah, let's stick it at 40. Now, what you should be able to notice actually two things. One, it does change the tone of that kick drum, but what it also does is change the uh, the volume or the amplitude that's coming out quite significantly, really. And this is quite important for us because when we remove frequencies, we affect amplitude. And now it might not be amplitude that we can actually hear, but we are affecting the amplitude that is being registered by um, the metering devices. So it's not always... Uh, a good idea to rely on these meters of as to how loud a sound actually is or how loud a sound uh, is going to be perceived to be rather those are two very different things one of the other things that we can do to this kick drum is add a transient to it uh, the transient is the attack or the start of the kick drum and it's, it's that first initial hit as the beater would hit the skin of the drum uh, and again we need to emulate that to a certain degree we could leave what we have here because we are creating one with this pitch envelope, but we can create a slightly stronger one if we do something else. Literally add one. There's a few different ways we can add one. So first off, let's have a quick listen again. One of the ways we can add one is uh, we could get a sample, find the transient layer from a, a kick that we like the sound of, and, and just cut that section out and then layer the two. Nothing wrong with that at all. If we wanted to keep true to the whole synthesis concept that we've got going on here, we add another layer. So uh, if I very quickly add another layer, uh, it doesn't matter too much what note we go for, um, but what does matter is that it's tiny. Uh, and what I have actually got, and I probably should have mentioned, it's an ever so slight offset on the kick drums note. Uh, if we zoom right in, you can see that I am one, one one hundred and twenty eight uh, off the start point there, uh, and that allows for this transient to come in essentially over the top. So, with this transient, we're going to be using envelopes again, but this time we're going to be having a very very short and very clicky main envelope. So let's have a quick listen to how this sounds as it is. That's just the transient layer. All I've done there is I have adjusted um, the way that this sounds, not through the envelope now, but I'm starting to play around with phase modulation and uh, changing waveforms. I'm not choosing a waveform based on anything in particular, other than I know that these have got more harmonics in them. Um, so I'm just adding more harmonics to the sound uh, so that these will then modulate 
my uh, my carrier signal, which is just again a simple sine wave. I could use a square. So I kind of like that one, so I'm going to probably stick with that. we can see where we're starting to head with this but let's mix it in a little bit better Now, if we want to glue these two together, best way of doing that is with some compression. So let's do that. The aim of the compressor here is not to make something quieter or make something louder particularly. It's to glue these two sounds together. I was going to do that by doing what it does. It's going to compress the two sounds uh, so that they sound more like they are working together and are one instrument. For some reason there's a slight glitch where I don't get to see the audio coming through this channel uh, which is a little annoying but never mind um, what I'm going to do is use this anyway But for me, that started to work like a kick now. If you start then to um, mix that into a track with other drums, you start adding some reverb through auxiliary sounds and making it sound like it's playing in a room. Uh, you maybe add your distortion, things like that. After you've created that transient layer and layered the two things together, uh, maybe when you create a snare drum, you use the same transient so that there's some uh, consistency between the two sounds. Things like that, little um, bits and pieces like that can really help glue the sounds of a, a drum kit together in a space. Well, hopefully that was useful for you folks. Stay tuned for any future videos on various other sound effects processing and synthesis techniques. Until then, cheers.